Tonight we're beginning a brand new chapter. Uh, we're going to look at Mark chapter 13 and we're going to focus on verses 1 through 4. Uh, Jesus will give a speech in verses 5 through 37. So tonight we're going to introduce that particular speech. Uh, just a reminder, we're in the final section, the final act of the Gospel of Mark. It's the Passion Narrative. It begins in chapter 11, verse 1, through the end of the book. And it's amazing that Mark writes so much about the last week of Jesus' life. Uh, he devotes about one-third of the Gospel to talking about what we call Holy Week. And we can divide this into three sections. Uh, the first one is the confrontation. Uh, Jesus is going to confront the religious leaders, the religious authorities, uh, something he didn't have to do much when he was in Galilee, but now that he's shown up in Jerusalem, there's this confrontation that takes place. Then in chapter 13 is Jesus' speech on coming events, and the crucifixion narrative actually begins in chapter 14, verse 1. We've just finished this section, the confrontation in Jerusalem. It began with chapter 11, verse 1, to the end of chapter 12. Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding on the donkey in fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, then Jesus does a couple of prophetic, symbolic acts that probably nobody understood what he was doing. Uh, Jesus curses a fig tree. The fig tree represents the nation of Israel. He judges Israel before Israel gets a chance to judge him. And then Jesus will cleanse the temple. And in many ways, he symbolically overthrows the temple. And we're going to talk a little bit tonight about why Jesus would want to do that. And then there were the controversies, seven of them, back to back to back, as Mark puts them. Uh, seven straight controversy stories, Jesus and the religious leaders. Uh, sometimes the religious leaders would ask Jesus a question, and at the end, when people quit asking Jesus questions, he asked them a question about the identity of the son of David. And in many ways, he kind of hinted at who he was uh, during that time. And then it finally concludes with Jesus in the temple and watching people give to the temple treasury, and there's this widow who throws in two little coins. Uh, but those were the last two coins the woman owned. She gave everything into the temple treasury. Uh, so Jesus will contrast her uh, with the rich people who were just kind of giving a little offering and making a big show of it, but she actually gave out of love and devotion in her heart. Well, today we began a brand new section. It's called the Coming Events Speech. Uh, Jesus is going to tell his disciples what's going to come in the future. And it's interesting that this particular speech goes by a lot of different names, and I want to explain those names and maybe introduce a term or two that you're not familiar with, but I'll try to explain these, especially the first one. Some have called this the eschatological discourse. Uh, you may have heard of the word eschatology. Eschatology is the study of last things. It's the study of the last days. It's the study of the events leading up to the return of Christ. Uh, so all of that study uh, is called eschatology. That's kind of the formal name for it. So it's the study of those events that will take place as this age comes to an end and Jesus will come to bring about his kingdom on earth so that this present age is concluded and Jesus begins a new age of his kingdom. Sometimes, instead of the eschatological discourse, it's called the apocalyptic discourse, another big word. Uh, the word apocalypse, apocalyptic means revealed. Uh, it's the revelation, the revealing of things to come in the future especially things dealing with the end of the world. Uh, in fact, even in our own uh, vocabulary as the secular world, we'll talk about the apocalypse or things of that nature. It's the end of this present age and the beginning of the kingdom of God. And there are references in Jesus' speech to such events. Uh, Jesus will tell his disciples that he's coming back. 
they have no clue that he's leaving, you know? <laughs> you know, they're still thinking he's going to set up his kingdom in the next week or so. Uh, but Jesus will tell his disciples, I'm coming back one day. Uh, and he's going to tell them some of the signs leading up to his second coming. Uh, it's interesting that he also tells them not to be disturbed by events that are yet to come, even within their own lives. And in particular, he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the Jewish temple. Uh, he's basically telling them that Christianity, belief in him, is going to live beyond the destruction of the temple and the end, basically, of the nation of Israel. So he tells them when these horrible events take place, uh, hang on to your faith. It's not the end yet. The end is yet to come. And when you see individuals on the scene, uh, don't, don't go over the top. Uh, you know, remain solid in your faith. Uh, the first century saw some really nasty things, like Nero and his persecution of Christians. It saw the destruction of the nation of Israel and the temple. Uh, and Jesus is hinting at all of these things, and he's telling them, don't be disturbed by them. Uh, it's interesting today, uh, since I've been alive, every time something catastrophic happens in the world, uh, people think Jesus is coming. <laughs> you know, if something bad happens, oh, it must be the last days, Jesus is coming, you know, real soon. Uh, I, of course, did not live during World War II. But I am positive that people during World War II thought Jesus was going to show up at any moment. I mean, you know, Hitler was the ideal Antichrist. Uh, six million Jews lose their lives. That looked like the perfect time for Jesus to come. But guess what? He didn't. Just like the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple would have been the perfect time for Jesus to come. But he didn't. So just because crazy things are happening in the world does not necessarily mean that Jesus is coming anytime soon. In fact, it was interesting that after World War II, shortly thereafter, the nation of Israel was reborn in 1948. So God used that horrible series of events to bring about the rebirth of Israel. But even with the rebirth of Israel, Jesus did not come right away. So there is that element of the end times in Jesus' speech. There's also the prophetic part of this. Jesus is going to act like a prophet. And Jesus is going to make a prediction. Jesus will predict that that beautiful Jewish temple will be completely destroyed. Jesus speaks those words in A.D. 30, approximately. Forty years later, Jesus' words become a reality. And in A.D. 70, the Romans destroy the Jewish temple. But it's interesting that Mark's gospel was written sometime in the 60s. So if you were listening to or reading Mark's gospel for the very first time and you read what Jesus says about the Jewish temple, you're going, wow, because that Jewish temple was still standing when Mark's gospel was written. In fact, many of the apostles never saw the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, Peter never saw it. Paul never saw it. They died in the 60s before that happened in AD 70. So Jesus is going to make a prediction. It, it's a prophecy. And then the third one's the easiest. It's called the Olivet Discourse because Jesus gives a speech from the Mount of Olives. It's kind of like the Gettysburg Address. It's named after the place where the speech was given. And so Jesus gives a speech on the Mount of Olives. It's called the Olivet Discourse. Other people view this speech as a farewell address. We don't know which day of the week Jesus gives this speech. Chapter 14 opens, and it's Tuesday. But it looks like this speech may have been given on Wednesday or Thursday. So Mark may not have put things in chronological order when he did this. 
Um, but Jesus knows he's leaving soon. The disciples don't know that, but yes. Jesus does. And Jesus knows before the week is over, he's going to be crucified. And so in many ways, Jesus wants to prepare the disciples for life without him. You know, right now, if the disciples have a question, as they're going to have a question in chapter 13, just go ask Jesus. You know, that was easy. Uh, if you've got an issue, just go to Jesus. But what happens when Jesus isn't here anymore? Uh, that becomes the issue. How will the disciples survive without Jesus physically present with them here on this earth? And so in many ways, those who see this as a farewell address don't see it so much as a prophecy about the end times. They see it as Jesus preparing his disciples for the rest of their lives here on earth, which would be somewhere between AD 30 and 70. So he prepares them for those 40 turbulent years. Uh, the church during those years is on mission to share the message of Jesus, but they have to share it in the middle of persecution. They also have to share the message of Jesus in the middle of chaos. The Jewish people will actually rebel against Rome in AD 66. And four years later, the war's over and Rome wins and Israel is no more. Christianity had to survive that too. So in many ways, Jesus is preparing his disciples for what they're gonna experience the rest of their lives. And I think both number one and number four are present in this speech. In fact, the way I'm going to treat it is, uh, yes, there is a lot of history in Jesus' speech. And a lot of what Jesus said was absolutely fulfilled in the next 40 years. But not everything. Uh, some of it is yet to come. So I'm going to treat this as history and also as future events uh, of the end times as well. And we're going to look at both of those. This is Mark chapter 13. It's Jesus' final speech. In fact, there's only two long speeches of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. The first one's in chapter 4. It's Jesus' parables, and he tells several in a row. This is the longest speech recorded in the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark doesn't have the Sermon on the Mount like Matthew has, which goes on for three chapters. Uh, this is the longest speech in the Gospel of Mark, and it takes place right before the crucifixion story that begins in chapter 14. So in order to understand who Jesus is and what his mission is, Jesus is telling them you have to see the whole picture. Jesus will soon be crucified. He'll be buried. He'll rise from the dead on the third day. Total surprise and shock to his disciples. Forty days later, he'll ascend into heaven. He'll take his place at the right hand of God, at the position of authority, with the promise that one day he will return and fulfill all things. He will come back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He will come back and make all things new. He will keep his promise. So to understand Jesus, you have to understand the whole package the whole picture. If you only understand Jesus crucified, it's going to look like he failed. You know, here's another would-be Messiah who gathers a following, but it's put down and it's dead when he dies. But no, he's resurrected. He's ascended. He's coming again. So to understand Jesus, we have to understand everything about him. So here is a brief outline of Mark chapter 13. It begins with a prediction given by Jesus of the end of the temple. The temple is going to go away. And then there's Jesus talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, part one. And we find that in verses 5 through 23. And then Jesus will mention the fact he's coming again in verses 24 to 27 
But then he'll go back and talk about the destruction of Jerusalem again, part two. And then he'll mention his coming again, part two, at the end of the chapter. So again, it's both near history, the next 40 years, and also distant future, his second coming, the time when Jesus returns. So we're going to look at all of that. And we begin tonight with the story of the end of the temple. And I want to read those verses and then we'll talk about them. Picking up a brand new section, a brand new chapter, chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. It says, as Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings? Replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? So chapter 13 opens with Jesus leaving the temple. Uh, it's interesting that in our Bibles we have chapters and verses. When Mark wrote his gospel, he did not put those chapters and verses in there. Uh, some later editor did that. So when Mark wrote his gospel, he just wrote. He didn't put chapter divisions or verse divisions. So there's a question about chapter 13, verse 1. Does it go with the previous stories as a conclusion? Or does it introduce the speech that Jesus is going to begin in verse 5? And in many ways, it does both. Chapter 12 ends with Jesus in the court of women. Uh, he's watching people in the treasury. It's the last of seven controversy stories. The story ends with Jesus praising this woman. And then it says Jesus left the temple. Well, Jesus has been going to the temple every day since he arrived in Jerusalem. And in Mark's gospel, Jesus arrives in the temple in chapter 11, verse 27. And he has stayed there all the way until the end of this verse. So in many ways, this verse is the conclusion of those controversy stories, all of which take place in the temple. But now Jesus is leaving the temple. And as we're going to talk about in a couple of moments, Jesus never goes back to the temple. He leaves the temple for the last time. He will never return. Now, again, we don't know what day of the week this is. If it's Thursday, there's a really good reason why he never goes back. He gets arrested that night. But... Historically, that may be true, but theologically and thematically, Mark's going to make a point, which I'll talk about in a couple of moments. So in many ways, this concludes the controversy stories. Jesus was in the temple having all these controversies. He's now left the temple, which means the controversies are over. At the same time, this verse introduces the next story. Uh, Jesus is leaving the temple, and then one of the disciples is going to talk about the temple and say to Jesus, wow, what a temple we have. And that's going to lead to Jesus' prediction about the temple, and then it's going to lead to the disciples asking Jesus that question, when will this happen and what will be the signs of its coming? So in many ways, this is a transitional verse from the seven controversies to Jesus' speech. This verse opens with Jesus leaving the temple. And again, he's been there since chapter 11, verse 27. Jesus leaving the temple in many ways equals Jesus rejecting the temple. Physically, Jesus leaves the temple. Theologically, He's also going to leave the temple. Let's look at it, first of all, physically. Jesus is in the temple. 
He's in the court of women. That's where the temple treasury was located. It was called the court of women, but it wasn't just for women. Uh, Jewish men could be there too. In fact, the only requirement to be in the court of women is you had to be Jewish. If you were Gentile, you weren't allowed in there. You had to stay in the court of the Gentiles. But if you were Jewish, you could go to the court of the women. And so he leaves there. And so then he exits the temple by going out of the court of the Gentiles. He'll then leave through that gate, uh, which we find right here. And most call that the East Gate. So Jesus will leave through the East Gate. He will cross the Kidron Valley. And he will end up on the Mount of Olives. And that's where he'll give this speech. And chances are Jesus followed this same route every day during Passover week because he was staying in Bethany. Mm -hmm. Bethany is the home of Lazarus and his two sisters. That's where Jesus spent the week. Every day he was in the temple. When the sun went down, he walked home to Bethany and hung out with Lazarus and Mary and Martha mm -hmm. for the rest of the evening. So that's the route, most likely, that Jesus takes. He goes through the temple, he goes out the east gate, and he ends up on the Mount of Olives to give the speech. Well, what's so significant about that? Well, many scholars find a parallel between the route that Jesus takes and the fact that God's Spirit, the glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God, will leave the temple right before the Babylonians destroy Solomon's temple. Uh, many of you studied Jeremiah in Sunday school, and one of the things that people kept saying to Jeremiah is, the temple, the temple, the temple, God won't let anything happen to his temple. So even though we're breaking all the Ten Commandments, it doesn't matter because God lives in the temple and God's not going to let anything happen to his house. Well, little did, did the Jewish people know that God's glory would leave the temple before the Babylonians showed up. So the glory of God leaves. And Ezekiel talks about how this happens. Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 18. Then the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple. That was a horrible day. When God's presence, God's glory leaves the temple. And Ezekiel goes on and says, While I watched, the cherubim spread their wings and rose from the ground. And as they went, the wheels went with them. They stopped at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house. The same gate that Jesus went through. So they stopped there, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. Then Ezekiel 11, 22 and 23, Then the cherubim with the wheels beside them spread their wings and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. The glory of the Lord went up from within the city and stopped above the mountain east of it. What mountain is east of the gate? It's the Mount of Olives. So in many ways, the glory of God leaves the temple in the same way that Jesus leaves the temple. The glory of God did not return in those days, and Jesus would not return to the temple. So here is God the Son in the temple, leaving the temple, never to return. And because he leaves the temple, and because the divine leaves the temple, the temple can then be destroyed. And the Babylonians did destroy Solomon's temple in 586 B.C., Forty years from Jesus' prediction, the Romans will destroy this temple in A.D. 70. Interesting parallel. Uh, I'm not sure how many people back in Mark's day figured that one out, uh, but scholars have since seen a parallel between Jesus' departure and the departure of God's glory. The story continues with one of Jesus' disciples saying to him, and it doesn't say which disciple, could have been one of the twelve. It could have been another disciple that was following Jesus as well. And he says to Jesus, look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. He's talking about the temple. Mm -hmm. The temple was an absolutely incredible structure. 
And I kind of get the impression, you know, with the disciples, for the most part, being from Galilee, okay, country boys, uh, they're now in the big city, and they see this incredible temple, and it's like, wow, look at that. You know, it's like going to New York City for the first time and seeing all the lights and going, wow. Uh, that's kind of the impression that we get as the disciples look at this temple. Josephus writes this about the stones. Some of the stones were 37 feet long by 12 feet high by 18 feet deep. I mean, they were just massive, huge. And it's amazing that ancient people built that way and were able to do that. Uh, but they did. The disciples were also just in awe of the beauty of that temple. And I want to quote what Josephus writes about the beauty of the temple. He says, being covered on all sides with massive plates of gold, the sun was no sooner up than it radiated so fiery a flash that persons straining to look at it were compelled to avert their eyes as from solar rays. To approaching strangers, it appeared from a distance like a snow-clad mountain, for all that was not overlaid with gold was of the purest white. You can just imagine the sun coming up, glistening off of the gold of the temple, and you try to look at it and it kind of blinds your eyes. You know, your eyes start watering uh, when you see it. And if you see the temple from a distance, it looks like snow-clad white. Uh, it was just absolutely gorgeous. It was beautiful. It was one of the incredible structures of the ancient world it was an architectural wonder at that time. And the Jewish people loved their temple. I mean, it was their pride and joy. Uh, it was King Herod who beautified the temple. The Jewish people couldn't stand him, but they loved what he did for their temple. It was as beautiful as Solomon's temple. They took great pride in it. And they, like their ancestors believed that God lived in the Holy of Holies in that temple. This was God's home. This was God's house. God lived there. And they also believed that God would not let anything happen to his temple. The disciples could not see that the temple was a barren fig tree. And from Jesus' perspective, the temple had to go away. Why? The temple was all about the sacrificial system. How did people deal with their sins? They brought sacrifices to pay for their sins. And the Jewish people had a tradition called the Day of Atonement. And on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, the place where God's presence was said to, to live. And he would take blood from a sacrifice, sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. And if God accepted the, the offering, the sacrifice, the blood, then God promised to forgive the people's sins for one year. The next year, you had to do the same thing over again. And at no time in history did the high priest come out of the Holy of Holies and say, good news, everybody. This is the final sacrifice. God has accepted this blood for all time, and we never have to do this again. Now, one of the issues with the sacrificial system was there was no end. You just do it again and again and again and again. Well, Jesus was going to offer himself as the sacrifice for sin. Once and for all time. And God was going to accept Jesus' sacrifice. Once and for all. For the forgiveness of sins. Jesus doesn't need the temple. In fact, the temple in many ways is a rival of Jesus. The temple has to go. And Jesus predicts the temple is going to go. In the very next verse. Jesus says, do you see all these great buildings? And Jesus recognized, yeah, this is pretty impressive. You know, this is beautiful. This is gorgeous. 
But yet, Jesus says, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Jesus apparently says this as he's leaving the court of the Gentiles. The disciples hear what he says, but so does a lot of other people. This is the first time Jesus clearly comes out and says, the temple will be destroyed. Mm -hmm. He has hinted at it, but he's never really come out and said it. When Jesus overthrew the tables and cleared out the temple, in essence, Jesus was overthrowing the temple. But nobody could figure out that that's what he was doing. When Jesus told the parable of the wicked tenant farmers, the religious leaders, including the chief priests, including all those who worked at the temple, would be overthrown and replaced. But they had no clue that Jesus was talking about the overthrow of the temple, and that's why they would be out of a job. Without a temple, there's no need for a priest. So Jesus has hinted at this. This is the first time he's actually come out and said it. During Jesus' trial, they're trying to find something that Jesus did wrong so they could crucify him. Somebody said, well, Jesus predicted that I'll destroy the temple and in three days I'll rebuild it. Well, according to that person, Jesus predicted that he would destroy the Jewish temple. Now, in the first century, there were two things you don't mess with unless you want to get into a fight with a Jewish person. Number one, you don't mess with Moses. And number two, you don't mess with the temple. So if somebody comes along threatening to destroy the temple, that would be like a capital crime among the Jewish people. Yeah, terrorist. Yeah, so that person would be crucified. You know, the Jewish people would want that person put to death for what he said. Jesus was actually talking about his own physical body, which would be killed, and in three days he would rise again. And even when Jesus was on the cross, as they were mocking him, they would say, yeah, he, that's the one who's going to destroy the temple in three days, rebuild it. Uh, Mark makes the point that Jesus didn't say that he would destroy the temple. Jesus only said it would be destroyed. And as it turns out, Jesus doesn't destroy the temple, at least not physically. Theologically, he does, but not physically. It's the Romans who destroy the temple. But it was Jesus' death on the cross, and the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom, meaning the way to God is now open for everyone through Christ. So, in essence, theologically, he did destroy the temple, but he didn't physically do so. This prediction might explain why the crowd turns on Jesus. Up to this point, any time the crowd is mentioned, uh, it never says that the crowd says anything, but they seem to side with Jesus against the religious leaders. Maybe this prediction causes the crowd to think differently about Jesus if he's going to destroy their temple or at least that's the way they understood it. Well, the temple does get destroyed in AD 70. The Romans destroy it. Uh, the war had been going on for about four years, and finally Rome sent the big army uh, into Jerusalem, led by Titus. And somebody set the temple on fire. We really don't know who did that. It may not have been a Roman soldier who did it, but somebody did it, according to Josephus. And once the temple was set on fire, that was the beginning of the end. And once the fire had burned, they started knocking down the walls, according to Josephus. It's amazing they could knock down those stones. That is true, yes. I can't imagine what they were using. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, maybe after it had burned, it became easier to knock them down. I don't, I'm not sure. But what was left is actually not part of the temple, but the outer platform of the temple, the western wall or the wailing wall that still exists today. But the temple itself, Jesus is correct. One stone will not be left on another. They knock the entire thing down. So Jesus' prophecy is fulfilled. And again, 
when Mark records this, it's in the 60s, the temple is still standing. Uh, it was only a few years later that the temple was actually destroyed. So Jesus makes this grand pronouncement. And I'm sure everybody's mouth just dropped. It's like, oh, wait a second. You know, this can't happen. Uh, in fact, the Jewish people, the disciples are thinking one day Jesus will own that temple as the king and he'll be the Lord of that temple. But Jesus says, no, that temple's going to go bye-bye. So as Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, and again, Jesus goes out of the temple through the east gate, across the Kidron Valley, and into the Mount of Olives. And once he does that, four disciples come up to Jesus privately. And it's often true in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus will say something, you know, say it in public, and later the disciples will say to Jesus, remember when you said such and such? Uh, can you explain that to us? And that's what's going on here. So Peter, James, John, and Andrew want to know more about what Jesus just said. It's interesting that those four disciples were the first four disciples that Jesus calls in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, they happen to be two sets of brothers. Peter and Andrew are brothers, and so are James and John. And all four of those men know how to fish for a living. So that's where Jesus called them, out of the fishing business into God's business. So they take Jesus aside privately with a couple of questions. The first one is, when will these things happen? You know, Jesus, is this going to happen next week, next month, next year, in the next 20 years? Is it going to be 100 years? Will it be 1,000 years? Is this something I need to concern myself with? I mean, obviously, if it's 1,000 years from now, I probably don't need to concern myself with it. But if it's going to happen in my lifetime, uh, I'd like to know some more information about this. So when will it happen? And we're going to look at some of the clues that Jesus gives them in his speech. And then they also want to know the signs that it's going to happen. You know, how can we know we're getting close? You know, if somebody's going to come and destroy this temple, we don't want to be in Jerusalem when that happens. We want to be as far from Jerusalem as we can get, because otherwise we could lose our lives. And as it turns out, many Christians survive A.D. 70 and the Roman destruction of Jerusalem because they did get out of town, because Jesus tells them that they needed to do that. And we'll look at that in the speech as well. So they're really asking, the disciples are, when will the destruction of Jerusalem happen? And what are the signs leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem? Now, the disciples are not asking Jesus, what are the signs of your second coming? Because again, they don't know anything about a second coming. You know, they don't even know Jesus is going anywhere at this point. So they're not going to ask that question, although Jesus will throw that in. He will talk about the end of the age. He will talk about his second coming but that's really not what they're asking so most of Jesus answer will focus on those two questions and we're going to learn a lot about life in Israel from AD 30 to AD 70 and a little bit about what the disciples experienced being Christians during that time and then Jesus will give some signs not only of the destruction of Jerusalem, but also of his second coming. In many ways, we could read Mark chapter 13, verses 5 through 37, in the sense that it all happened in the first century, except for one thing. Jesus forgot to come back. <laughs> if Jesus would have come back, everything he said in Mark chapter 13 would have been fulfilled. But he didn't come back. So life moved on, and the church had to move on. And Mark writes this gospel to Gentile Christians, probably Christians living in Rome. Rome, in the first century. You had to put up with Nero. You had to survive Nero. 
which, which by, by the way, way Peter, Peter and Paul didn't survive Nero. Somehow the church had to survive Nero. And then, all of a sudden, six years later, what's this rumor about the Romans destroying Jerusalem? Uh, I thought Jesus was the king of the Jews. How can Jerusalem be gone? How can the nation of Israel be gone? What does that mean for us? Those were good questions that Mark's readers would have been asking. And again, Mark probably wrote this book even before Nero began his persecution. So all of this is yet to come in their lives. Well, we'll jump in next week, beginning in verse 5 to Jesus' speech, and talk about what Jesus tells them about life in the first century and also life leading up to his second coming. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these verses. Thank you. Uh, for just the understanding of what Jesus did, that Jesus didn't need a temple because he was both the high priest and the lamb that would be sacrificed. He offered himself as the perfect sacrifice, and Father, we thank you that he did. It's because of his sacrifice that we know our sins are forgiven, that we know we have a forever place with you. So, Father, I pray as we continue to study Jesus' speech, that it will give us insight into the struggles of the first century church, uh, the struggles that we have today, and also some insight into when Jesus might come or what Jesus is telling us about his coming. So, Father, most of all, may we be faithful to you, may we be strong in our faith, may we trust you with everything that happens. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.